back and back in the building. So fire away. Neil, just how would you describe uh, this roster that you've assembled? God, uh, that's a tough one. Um, well balanced um, and highly competitive, I guess. Um, it's an interesting roster, Jace, because I think there, there's a lot of continuity, right? So I think some of the some of the new guys, I don't know. I, I think the returning players are probably more out in the forefront than the additions of Larry and Cody and Ben and Tony. You know what I mean? Um, but I, I'm really excited about the depth. Um, you know, I think we've had depth in terms of talent before um, and upside with some of the younger guys, but I think this is probably the best depth we've had, you know, since we've kind of built around Dame. Um, in terms of veteran presence, guys you know, and we, we probably go 10, 11 deep with guys you can put in a meaningful game that can play productive minutes when it matters, not just, you know, unknown quantities hoping to get a pop from them. I mean, I think Chauncey probably has the luxury of knowing at least one through 11 what he's going to get when he puts a guy out on the floor. You said at the end of the last season that you wanted to improve the defensive abilities of the bench. Do you feel you accomplished that with the guys you added? I do. Um, obviously, you know, early on, you know, through free agency, I think, you know, I think we had success we don't normally have, Aaron, in the, um, in the vet minimum market. Um, I think adding guys like Cody and, um, you know, Tony and, and Ben are kind of maybe a level above the guys we've traditionally gotten, you know, early in free agency when it came to vet minimum. So that helped. But, you know, the, the trade for Larry later in the summer um, that I worked on with Kobe Altman and Arturis, that made a major impact. I mean, I think his versatility, um, you know, his analytics were off the charts on the defensive end of the floor, his activity. And I think that, you know, the coaching staff, and you can ask Chance when he gets up here, but I think the coaching staff's excited because the way he plays on the defensive end really translates to the style of play that they're looking to implement, um, you know, for us this season. So I think, I think the guys are a really good fit stylistically, and I think they're also guys that in any system can contribute on the defensive end. Um, and they have enough experience where, like I said, I think what we're really comfortable with is these are guys that have played winning basketball, they've played meaningful minutes, so I don't think there's any reluctance or reticence to, to not put guys in positions where we really need production. Neil, since the last time you talked to us, there's been some reporting from a few different outlets about the investigations that you guys ran during the coaching search into the allegations against Chauncey in terms of you know not reaching out to the accuser's attorney. All this is there any more light that you can maybe shed on that whole process now? Yeah, I, you know, Sean, I appreciate you know you asking the question, and I totally understand why you know you'd be interested in revisiting it. Um, but it's been well chronicled since then, and what we really want to focus on is the impact Chauncey's already made around our team in the locker room with our staff. He's already been out in the community, meeting with sponsors, meeting with you know, people within the organization. Um, he was a major asset for us during the free agent period in terms of recruitment, um, which is one of the main reasons why we ended up with guys like Cody and Tony very early in free agency and Ben. So um, that's what we're focused on right now, and that's what we're going to be continue to focus on uh, moving forward. Neil, as you know, much was made about Dame and his happiness uh, this offseason. Just what's your read on where he's at after all your moves and, and what has your guys' interaction been like? Well, on, on, on a couple things, you know, to be a little glib, he got married and won a gold medal. So, <laughs> so I'm sure those contributed to his happiness. But, um, you know, look, Dame and I, you know, it's an interesting thing. Dame and I communicate all the time in the offseason. You know that. You know, you've been here with us the whole run since Dame and I came in. This one, I think we just, more of the communication happened in a public forum. So I think there was more commentary, you know, on where the dynamics of the relationship were. And Dame and I get along great. I mean, I think, you know, the conversations we've had are no different than the conversation we had three years ago after we got, um, you know, we got beat 4-0 by New Orleans and what were we going to do and how were we going to get better and, you know, the frustrations of, you know, a first round playoff exit. Um, and, you know, and I think what Dame really wants to know is that the sense of urgency and the competitiveness that he has 
that everybody in the organization rises to that same level. You know, when we've talked, he just wants to know that winning is as important to everybody from myself to Chris to Chauncey to the staff to ownership as it is to him. And I think, you know, as he grows in his career, that urgency kind of accelerates. But, you know, the one thing I think you'll know about Dame, and he and I talked about this, is when he's in, he's in. And, you know, following his honeymoon, he was the first guy back on the floor working out. And there's no rearview mirror for Damien. There's no revisionist history. When he buys in, he's all in. And I don't think CJ was overstating that. I don't think CJ would have said that um, on the podcast were it not true and were it not something he'd already discussed with Dame. So, you know, obviously you guys will have access to Dame here in the next little bit, but um, he's fired up to be here. I think he likes the additions we made in the offseason. Um, Dame always has a belief that we can compete at the highest level. And I think he knows that we exhausted every opportunity to improve the roster through trade and free agency. And he knows we'll continue to work on that throughout this um, early part of the season and up to the trade deadline like we always do. When Damien expressed his unhappiness or displeasure and said that he wasn't sure what he was going to do, did that add pressure to you to try and pull off some type of move? And do you feel he's happy with the roster the way it is? And also, did you feel a lot of calls from teams thinking there was blood in the water, let's try and go get Damian Lillard? Three-parter. Um, let's see, starting with one. Um, it, anybody in this job knows it's, an, it's constant pressure. Um, you know, it's pressure from fans, from season ticket holders, from media, from sponsors, from ownership, from ourselves. I mean, we wouldn't be in this position if we weren't competitive. Um, you know, it manifests itself differently when you're a front office executive versus a coach versus a player versus an owner. But none of us would be doing this day in and day out if we weren't competitive and didn't want to win. So I think that's just a given um, from a competitive standpoint. Um, you know, Chauncey and I talk about this all the time. There's no one more competitive than me at times because I love basketball and I wasn't good enough. And so I've got to find another avenue to compete in the game that I love. And this is kind of the avenue that I've that I've taken. So competitively, I think we're all on the same page. Um, and from a uh, pressure standpoint, there's always pressure. You know, you lose in the first round, there's pressure. We went to the Western Conference Finals, there was pressure because you're, you know, you're, you're so seduced by how close you were that that's almost even more frustrating at times. Um, and yeah, you know, calls come in and, you know, look, we're all friends. There's only 30 of us. They all know you know, basically, you know, there's, a, there's an old guy, there's a guy at uh, Rayo's named Frankie No, right? You call for a reservation, he answers the phone, no, right? Nobody can get a reservation at Rayo's. We answer the phone, call it on date, no. So, you know, I mean, but guys, you know, guys have to be able to tell their owner they went back and they made the phone call they knew was going to result in the answer they knew it was going to result in. But we all have jobs to do, and there's times where I've had to make those calls as well. But, you know, clearly we were never going to be receptive to, to moving Dame. Um, we're never going to be receptive to moving Dame. He's the bedrock of this organization, and he's going to be here for as long as he's happy and knows he has a chance to compete. This offseason has held a lot of firsts for this organization that Dame hasn't had to go through, you haven't had to go through, CJ hasn't had to go through with a coaching change and dealing with some of these calls that may have felt like they had more weight because of the external communication. I'm sorry, I'm sorry AJ. Having what? The coaching change, and then I lost you. Sorry. Oh, the coaching change that you and Dame haven't had to go through that mm -hmm. together since you've been here. So as you've reflected on the role that you've played this summer, what are some things you learned about this process of finding a new coach, hiring a new coach that you would have maybe done differently or you liked the way you did it? Just reflect on sort of what you've learned in this process. Well, I've, I've done a coaching search before, um, you know, obviously in, in Los Angeles. Um, you know, it, you know, it's a, it's a stressful situation, um, you know, doing a coaching search, especially on the heels of making a change from somebody who's as good a person as Terry, who was, a, was as successful as Terry was. You know, eight straight playoff appearances in nine years. Um, we had the number one offense in the history of the league, you know, post-trade deadline. Um, we worked really well together. So, you know, it's not just, I think, AJ, it's not just what you're moving toward at times with the search. It's kind of the... I wouldn't say damage, but the result, you know, that you left behind is, is always difficult. You're still dealing with that. And, you know, this one became very public very quickly. 
Um, you know, we had a conversation with Terry at 7 o'clock at night, and at 8 o'clock there was an article about who the candidates were. We hadn't even met yet to discuss the candidates um, or narrow the list. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I always joke with my colleagues around the league, you know, process versus results. And guys, guys talk about process quite a bit. Process is a way that to kind of appease your owner when you're not winning. <laughs> that you can result, rely on process. So, you know, you are, you're always going to think you did things differently. You're always going to do a post-mortem, whether it's a trade, whether it's free agency, whether it's a, it's a waiver, whether it's a coaching search, whether it's a hire in the front office. I mean, you want to know what you did well, what you didn't do well, what you do differently. But at the end of the day, we think we got a great coach. Um, he's a future, we were joking, as soon as the committee gets their act together, he's a future Hall of Famer as a player. He's going to be an outstanding head coach. He's put together an incredible staff. Um, the players are excited. Um, I think the, the returning guys are really engaged and excited about the potential of this coaching staff holds to make an impact in terms of wins and losses. And the new guys, you know, they're invested in this staff because, like I said, Chauncey played an integral role during the free agent period in terms of selling his vision, making guys comfortable with what their roles would be when they joined the franchise. Um, and so they're all, they're all coming in in a really good place mentally in terms of starting the season out. Uh, Neil, kind of a sign of the times here, but obviously a story in the off season and for the foreseeable future. How much of the team is vaccinated? Is the entire roster vaccinated? So the, the entire team is vaccinated. The entire basketball operations staff is vaccinated. Neil, this will be the seventh consecutive year you're building around Dame and CJ. Uh, how have you kind of balanced continuity with the definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and expecting different results? Yeah, and I guess everybody's, you know, definition of insanity is different too because there's a lot of places looking around the league at a team with the longest playoff streak in the NBA and trips to the conference finals and division championships and – you know, three seeds in the Western Conference, and as a benchmark, they'd like to actually reach. Um, you know, for us, that becomes the floor. I mean, we, I mean, I get it. You know, when you have sustained success the way we have, um, you know, we, we, we walk in every season accepting that the bar is we're expected to make the playoffs, and then what do we do after we get in? Um, so, I don't, you know, like I said, I think there's a model around the league. There are a lot of models where there's two guards. I just think the one with Damon CJ probably draws the most attention because it's been the most successful in terms of two guys that can both play point or play two, right? I mean, I don't want to say non-traditional. I want to compare it to traditional backcourts, but in terms of that model of two guards, right, you know, that might be considered undersized at the two-guard position, um, they've been successful, but there's other models of it around the league, Jason, that just haven't worked. So, um, like I said, we've built around it, uh, we support it, we've been successful with it, and like I said, I, I think bringing Chauncey in, who, like I said, is a future Hall of Famer at their position, um, will help them to the next level in terms of what they can do. Western Conference Finals with a team that the bottom talent and the, the depth, you know, 1 through 11, 1 through 12 that this roster has with that very same backcourt. Um, so, like I said, we believe in both those guys. We're excited about the pieces we put around them coming into the season, and we're excited about the impact Chauncey and his staff are going to have in terms of expanding their game and making them tougher covers on one end and, you know, more impactful on the other. Neil, what excites you about this club, the construction of it, and for fans to have optimism that uh, this team can go to the next level? Well, I, th I think it's, it's continuity and it's change. Um, you know, if you look at our ratings after we acquired, from, so before we acquired Norm, right, right around the trade deadline, we ranked sixth in offense and 29th in defense. The time we had with Norm, we ranked number one in offense and 21st in defense. So... From a continuity standpoint, there's a lot to like about this roster. Um, you know, with the starting lineup, you know, being intact, the impact Norm made. Um, and that was even at a point where he really wasn't fully comfortable with his role on the offensive end of the court. Ironically, his impact manifested itself much more on the defensive end. Um, and like I said, and the depth. I think the guys we've brought in, 
um, are going to be seamless fits into Chauncey's style of play on the defensive end. Um, he can talk more about that when, when he comes up. But like I said, the fact that he was a part of helping recruit those guys, identify those guys, knowing how they would fit in, um, not only have they bought into their role coming in, but I think he has a vision for how he's going to utilize those guys. So like I said, I think the luxury of having probably 11 guys you can put into a meaningful NBA game um, is a luxury we probably haven't had for the last few seasons. I think we've had a shallower roster or we've been coming off really successful seasons where we've had a high profile injury where we we're trying to patch that up in the off season. You said one of your goals in hiring a new coach was to find someone that fixed the defensive end of the ball. Chauncey has talked a lot about accountability at that end and improving the defense. Have you seen any evidence of players buying into that already this offseason, or have there not been opportunities? No, I mean, we haven't started, um, you know, practices yet. Um, you know, Chauncey and I have talked about it. Um, but I, I can just tell the guys in the building understand if we're going to get to the next level, really be a factor once we hopefully get to the playoffs, that they know it's on the defensive end. I mean, you could just, the conversations that you hear, and then when you have guys that are defensive-oriented players like Larry Nance, I mean, that's their, that's their mindset coming in. Um, we all know what kind of an impact Nurk has on the defensive end. You know, I think Rocco will be even better um, in a more active defense. And I think, you know, Dame's experience at the Olympics, um, you know, for him, you know, understanding how vulnerable teams are, you know, when they played Spain and France, when it was too easy on the offensive end for those, those teams to put up points, it puts such a pressure on the offense for those guys to pitch a perfect game that when they ratcheted up their defense, seeing that impact that it had. So, you know, I think we all saw it in the playoffs. I mean, the teams that really, that were 100% healthy, that defended are the teams that advanced. Um, and the teams that were overly reliant on the offensive end had a ceiling. And we know we're going to have to break that ceiling with, with what we do on the defensive end of the floor. Okay, we've got time for a couple more. We've got a lot of players and people to get through, so quick. Hey, Neil, is uh, everyone going to be able to practice tomorrow? Uh, you know, I haven't gotten a full report from, uh, from Jeff Clark yet. You know, honestly, um, the guys had the weekend off. I think the last workout was Thursday. And then I think it might have been voluntary Friday and then off Saturday, Sunday. So uh, I'm not sure right now. If, if it isn't, Jason, it's nothing major. It would be just a kind of a tweak here or a tweak there, something that came out of it, you know, the voluntary workouts for the last couple of weeks, but nothing, you know, nothing long term. And then can you explain a little bit uh, what you hope to see out of the four non-guaranteed guys and about that competition? Yeah, so, you know, if there had been a guy out there um, that we really felt like we were willing to commit that 14th spot to, we would have. Um, you know, we've got four really good players. I mean, these are guys with NBA bodies of work. Um, they're really talented. There are different points in their career. And I think it's probably the first time in a while we've had kind of an open competition, not for a 15th spot, which would be a luxury, but for the 14th spot, which is mandatory coming out of camp. So I'm excited about the fact that they'll not only be competing with one another, but I think they'll raise the bar in camp for everybody, that there's more at stake than just you know, rotation and role and guys understanding that there's a hierarchy, that really guys are fighting for their lives in camp, um, competing against themselves and having to do that against the established players on our roster. Okay, we'll wrap it up there, Neil. Thank you. We'll Thanks, have, everybody. Uh, have Coach a good Phillips morning. Just a couple minutes. Sorry, Neil.